All right, you can go ahead and grab your Bibles, open up to 1 Corinthians 6 as we continue in our series, The Better Yes, Understanding the Why of Biblical Sexuality. Uh, to call our culture sex is obsessed, uh, as you turn there, is, is really to insult the word obsession. It doesn't begin to cover it. Uh, Wendy Shallot, who's uh, a Jewish writer, uh, chronicles some of the sex obsession in our culture in her book, Girls Gone Mild. Uh, so she talks about some of the magazine articles that you could read. Uh, in Cosmo, for example, they've got uh, one where uh, the way to wow your, it's not a boyfriend anymore, but uh, your your, your hookup partner is to ask him for a ride home after you sleep with him. Uh, the idea being then, of course, you're showing uh, you don't want any strings attached here either. This is just totally casual, totally physical. One 16-year-old that had written into her website said, uh, the more detached you are from your sexuality, the cooler you seem in the eyes of your peers. It's a 16-year-old again. And this 16-year-old actually went on uh, to say that even adults, uh, her teachers, textbooks uh, that they're using, other books that she's read, magazines, even parents can urge teens to adopt this kind of no big deal approach to sexuality. And she's not the only one who feels this way. There was a study done in which a majority of teens reported they felt more pressure from their sex ed classes to have sex than they did from their girlfriend or boyfriend. Isn't that interesting? Now, why? Why all of this pressure? Why all of these voices almost demanding that we have no strings attached sex? It's because the dominant cultural narrative challenges the biblical sexual ethic. And as I said before, it doesn't just see it as quaint anymore, old-fashioned, it sees it as dangerous because it is preaching a message counter to the message uh, of the secular framework that we've adopted at this point. Again, you want to see how a house is constructed, you got to go back and look at the foundations. You start with certain godless foundations, and by godless I just mean you strip God out of the equation, right? You start with those foundations, and you're going to end up building a very, very different structure. Glenn Scrivener, uh, pastor, uh, kind of uh, details this a little bit. He's kind of got five steps as you're, you're building this house or something like that. Uh, you, know, or you start here with God in the equation, you start over here with God out of the equation, even if you're going in the same direction, when it comes to sexuality, you're gonna end up in really, really different places. So he says, biblically speaking, what do you have? Ultimate reality, you've got God is love. That's at the center of everything. God is love, of course, that means that history then is a love story. Right, his redemptive purposes working out in history. History is a love story. Sex is about proclamation then. Gender, as we saw last week, is a gift, and our bodies are the very temple of the Holy Spirit. But if we start on the other side, things are a little bit different. We don't have God anymore, so ultimate reality, whatever that even means, is just uh, power. Uh, whoever happens to be in control at that point, that's, that's it, that's all you've got. History, then, of course, is meaningless, uh, but it's just a meaningless series of power plays. So the U.S. is uh, currently the superpower in 50 years, it'll be China, and said, who cares? None of that matters. It's just, as a group, everybody's gonna be dead in the long run anyway. The sun's gonna burn out. Everything turns to nothingness. So history's meaningless power play. Sex, then, is just recreation. Gender is, as we saw last week, self-defined, and our bodies are just playgrounds. Playgrounds, that's it. So how we view God, right, the starting place that we choose when it comes to sexuality changes everything about how we view sex and sexuality. So if God exists, again, you're in church, so we're gonna start with that assumption. We think that one's true here. If God exists, what exactly are the implications for our sexuality? That's what we're trying to work out uh, this morning. So we've looked at some background information, again, some of the underlying assumptions in the last couple weeks. If you weren't here for those, highly, highly, highly encourage you to go back and pick those up because this is all building, okay? So we're, 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 you can't come in mid-sentence and hope to understand what's being talked about here. But if God exists, what are the 
the implications for our sexuality. That's what Paul lays out for us in our passage this morning. Now he's addressing some very postmodern Corinthians, which is a little bit interesting, of course, because the Corinthians back in the first century weren't postmodern. Um, that's you know 20th, 21st century stuff, except that they really were. Um, everything we believe today is just old ideas, very old ideas and new packaging. There's nothing new under the sun, as Ecclesiastes says. So what's happened is what they believed back in the first century was true, of course, because God wasn't in the equation, at least not the God of the Bible. And now we've stripped God back out of the equation, so of course, these look almost exactly the same. So Paul, in addressing these postmodern Corinthians, lays out for us God's take on sexuality. And so we're gonna walk through really four steps to make sure that we really get what God is saying and why it matters so much. That this is not just a, a, when it comes to biblical sexuality, we're not talking about just naked prohibition, just don't do this, okay, or anything like that, but a, really a positive vision for the purpose of sexuality. In a lot of ways, we're gonna unpack this across the next four weeks as well, but we're gonna start here today. So these four steps. First Corinthians six, let's start with step one, take sex seriously from verses 9 and 10. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? We're picking up mid-paragraph here. He's been talking about how foolish it is that Corinthians are suing each other. That means that they, they, they clearly don't have the spirit of God in them at all. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing that. So that's, that's where we are. But then he changes tack all of a sudden. Do not be deceived Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot overstate how seriously the Bible treats the sin of sexual immorality. It can shut you out of God's kingdom. And that's, that's as strong as it gets. It's no coincidence, of course, that Paul opens his list of vices, if you want, with sexual immorality. In fact, we saw the same thing last week in Mark chapter seven when Jesus is talking about all the evil things that come out of our heart, and what's the first one he says? Sexual immorality. It's always there. Now this word, uh, sexual immorality, pornea in Greek, or the sexually immoral pornoi in uh, Greek, it has a, 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 as, as its root the whole idea of to buy. Isn't that a weird thing to have when it comes to sex? But of course that is the sexually immoral mindset, to, to use instead of love. And that's why it's so significant. But what's Paul saying here? By putting this first, and again, a number of the uh, sins he lists here have to do with sexual immorality, examples of it. What you do with your body seems to matter. Is this no big deal approach that we've taken just doesn't square with scripture. You know, we've got euphemisms like, oh, it's Netflix and chill. Like, what could be less significant than that? And Paul here is going, no, that's not it. What you do with your body can determine your eternal, physical destiny. One commentator says, Paul assumes that since God's kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness, the unrighteous can have no part in it. If Christ is our king, we will live by the values of his kingdom. We will submit to his rule and reign which means we will see a radical transformation in our values, because they become kingdom values, and in our behaviors. That's not where we start, of course, but that's what's gonna happen in our lives as God keeps working in us if we're truly in submission to Christ. Here's the thing, practicing sin willfully and unrepentantly cuts you off from his rule and reign. It's a clear declaration, no, he's not really my king. It cuts you off from his rule and reign, it cuts you off from the hope of glory as well. C.K. Barrett, one of the foremost New Testament scholars of the last century, says this, he says, Christians, prone to, are, Christians are prone to self-deception by persuading themselves that God cannot mean his moral demands seriously. That is a temptation we face. Now, he doesn't really mean that, but he does. That's the thing, he does. And so we have to take his moral demands seriously as well to move from no big deal to no, this could not possibly be a bigger deal than it actually is. And by the way, just a quick word here, because you'll notice that it's not just sexual immorality that he's talking about here too. 
He lists some other sins, some sins where we go, you know, it's, it's slander. What's well, a little bit of gossip, especially in a social media age? No big deal, right? I mean, that's the approach we take to all sorts of things like arrogance and spiritual pride, judgmentalism, all sorts of sins that would exclude us from the kingdom of God. Now, this gets tricky, of course, because everyone right now is going, hang on. I thought this was a gospel-centered church. You got it on your banner out in the lobby. I thought we were saved not by works, but by grace, which we are, 100%. God has only ever saved the unrighteous, although he makes us righteous, as I said. But we are saved by grace through faith. By grace through faith. And living in characteristic, habitual, unrepentant sin belies our profession of faith. It shows that you don't actually mean what you say when you say, I believe in Jesus. I put my hope in him. And as James said, faith without works is dead. It's not real faith at all. So this is why Rosaria Butterfield, who was a lesbian atheist, writing a book about how awful Christians are because of their homophobia and bigotry, is converted in the process of writing that book. But when she speaks of this, she says that she was converted not out of homosexuality, which, I mean, tr- homosexuality is not even a real word. It's, it's a Freudian term. And by the way, Freud and the Bible do not agree at, at any point, I don't think. Uh, so it, not, it's converted not out of homosexuality, but out of unbelief, out of unbelief. That's the whole idea. That's true of absolutely every one of us, moving from unbelief to, no, my trust, my belief is actually in God, undoing Genesis 3, what we looked at the first week of this series. You know, it's interesting, uh, at a recent Gospel Coalition conference breakout session, uh, somebody asked Tim Keller, who's doing uh, one of the breakouts, what the biggest obstacle is to revival in our culture today. And he said this, this was fascinating, he said, here's the biggest obstacle that he sees, that almost all singles outside the church and a majority of singles inside the church are having sex. So he sees the biggest obstacle is just good old-fashioned fornication. That's the major obstacle. And, and, and the guy who was asking him the question, is, uh, it works for the college ministry, was like, really? Like, you think sex is the biggest obstacle? What about you know, all, all the assaults that come from this scientific worldview or from philosophy? I mean, haven't you read Richard Dawkins or something like that? And then Keller's like, sure, sure. Mm-hmm. Ho-hum, yes, that's there. Uh, but he, he's drawing on C.S. Lewis. I think he's right here when says, Lewis says that there are few things more unpalatable and even offensive to the modern person than the Bible sexual ethic. And it's so offensive that people will actually reject God because of the sexual ethic. And that's exactly what Keller is saying here. In fact, Keller goes on to tell the story of his friend who is a, a professor at a Christian college and uh, how he would um, address this situation, and, and he wasn't recommending it, just to want to be really clear about that. He actually said it's probably too cruel a tactic to use. But what would happen is these kids would come back, you know, a year or two after graduation and go visit their favorite professor and whatnot, and he'd go, how are you doing? How's your spiritual life? And they go, well, you know, I'm, I've been reading some Hegel, and I've got some, and, you know, and I got my doubts now, I think, and you know, I'm just not sure about the whole Christianity. There are a lot of contradictions in the Bible, you know that, don't you? And this professor would look at them and go, okay, who are you sleeping with? And what would happen, these nice little Dutch Reformed kids would, you know, faces would turn bright red, and they'd look down and stuff, and how did you know? How did you know? Because this is it, if you want to have sex in contrast to what God demands of you morally, well then what do you have to do? You have to remove God from the equation. So you have to find a reason not to believe in God. In other words, the biggest obstacle to faith when these kids are going off to college is not that they're hearing about Darwin, it's that they're meeting Darlene, the cute girl. (laughs) The floor below them who is making an offer that they do not refuse. And this is true. You may think maybe Keller's overblown at this point. There's a Christian Mingle survey. Christian Mingle is an online dating site. Um, now, this was of self-identified Christians. And um, self-identified is, is a really bad qualifier for Christian, okay? It's the worst possible way to determine if someone is a Christian or not. But it's the stats we have here. So of self-identified Christians on Christian Mingle, 61% were willing to have casual sex. 
Not just, I'm not married, but just like, no, I'm just talking hookup stuff, all right? So 61% willing to have casual sex. 23% really held the line. They said they needed to feel like they were in love first. Only 11% said, not a chance. I will wait until I'm married as God commands. 11%. You start to think Keller might be right on this point. And by the way, one reason why people find the Christian sexual ethics so offensive is because of the rampant hypocrisy in the church. We talk so much about this one issue over here, same-sex attraction, and meanwhile we're ignoring all these sins that are very prevalent in our churches. We don't seem to have any word of condemnation for them. It's a damage to our witness, of course. It's a dishonor to Christ, and that's all pretty significant. But the point Paul's making here is that it threatens your salvation to take sex seriously. Step two, live in light of eternity. Let's read verses 12 to 14. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. So it seems, as I said already, that first century Corinthians and 21st century Americans have a whole lot in common. Two things here in this short passage are easy believism and our low view of the body God created. The Corinthians hadn't fully reckoned with the prevailing culture of their day. They hadn't really fully extricated themselves from it. And so there are these vestiges of their former paganism on display here. And so Paul's countering this and he makes two pretty simple arguments. First, yes, you have a newfound freedom in Christ. Absolutely, that's true. You're not saved by works, but by grace through faith. So newfound freedom, uh uh-huh, but that freedom should lead you to make beneficial choices. Choices that are good for you and for those around you. And part of that means making choices that don't enslave you. You're not gonna be mastered by anything. This is very different from the view that almost always crops up when you start preaching salvation apart from works. Somebody's gonna distort that to to read something like this little ditty, I don't remember where I found it. Free from the law, oh happy condition, I can sin as I please and still have remission. That's the attitude the Corinthians have got here. I mean, this is why James wrote James and Jude wrote Jude. Uh, this, 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 this attitude's been there from the beginning, but nothing could be further from the truth as we saw above. Your salvation is at stake. And of course, as we'll see even in the coming weeks when we look at how sex is a uh, sexual revolution not beneficial and the damage that it does. And of course, many sexual choices are enslaving uh, as well. Pornography, probably chief among them today, but hardly alone. Then the second argument that he makes, though, more to our purposes today, where he says we're not free to do whatever we want with our bodies because our bodies are for the Lord. What he means by that, because you can tell by the context what he's saying here, that our bodies are destined to be with Jesus in the resurrection. Our bodies are eternal a resurrected body at least. So the argument that you get here to begin with runs similar to Proverbs 30 verse 20 where the adulterous woman, we read this about her, she eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. That's kind of what we have, right? Sex is just a, a natural appetite. You feel hungry, what do you do? You eat. You feel a sexual impulse, what do you do? You satisfy it. That's all there is to it. It's interesting because many of us would claim that the sexual revolution gives sex too much importance, and that's probably true. You see, many uh, of the people who kind of led the sexual revolution, uh, Foucault, Freud, Kinsey, guys like this, really see sex as almost a a version of salvation. Foucault, for example, uh, says sex is everything. Sex is more important than your soul. Okay, that's a really high view of sex. So yeah, we get that piece. But at the same time, the sexual revolution actually gives sex far too little importance <laughs> because it's nothing more than a strictly physical act like belching. And that's kind of what we have here. 
But last week we, we, we saw uh, that this view of the body is, is, is based on a set of assumptions about the cosmos, creation, right? And about our bodies as part of creation that we, we just can't affirm. and don't make sense of the reality we inhabit. We're gonna see that it actually denies science just in our next section, but it also denies the physical resurrection, which is what Paul is talking about here. And to deny the physical resurrection, the importance of it is to deny implicitly really everything Christ came to do, Christ's incarnation, his resurrection in the body, his ascension into glory in the body. At the end of time, the Christian will stand before God in his or her body. So what are you doing with it in the meantime? That's the question Paul's asking. Live in light of that eternity. You belong to God, body, and soul. That's verse 14. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. Step three. We'll spend the most time here. Step three, understand God's good standard for everyone. Verses 15 to 17. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body, for it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So as if to emphasize the importance of the body to rehumanize us, if I could put it that way, Paul reminds us that our bodies are actually members of Christ himself. This is his favorite metaphor for the church, of course. He frequently refers to us as the body of Christ. He's drawing from his own conversion experience. Acts chapter nine, he's on the road to Damascus and he sees a blinding light and he falls over and all that good stuff and he hears Jesus, the resurrected Christ, saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my followers? Except that's not what he says. He says, why are you persecuting me? And Paul, in his blindness for the next couple of days, you can tell this is rattling around in his brain for a while and he's going, but I'm not. I didn't persecute Jesus. I was persecuting the people who claim Jesus as Lord. And yet Jesus saw that as my persecuting him. What must that mean about the union between Christ and his people? how significant that must be. And so he just draws out the implications of this statement for our union with Christ. How does Paul always describe us? He doesn't call us Christians. He doesn't call us disciples in the Gospels. He talks about us being in Christ. That's our union. And you really can't understand Paul without understanding that key piece right there. But look at what that means. If I'm united with Christ, if I'm in Christ, body and soul, boy, it sure seems like it matters what I do with my body then. Plus, Paul goes on to say, in sex we actually unite with the other person, body and soul too. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. The whole idea of one flesh drawn from Genesis, that's that's a holistic union. That's more than just physical. So in sex, you unite with the other person body and soul, whether you intend to or not. I don't think I could make a more countercultural statement than that from the pulpit. That's it. That's as, as, as radical as I could possibly get. You unite body and soul when you have sex with someone. Now, recent scientific discoveries confirm what Paul says. Okay, I, just, I, I always love it. I, I love when science finally catches up to the Bible. It's like one of my favorite things to watch. There's an illustration, I don't remember who said this, but it was this picture of you know, these uh, cosmologists and theoretical astrophysicists and they're, they're scaling the mountain of human knowledge and empirical observation and they finally reach the summit to discover a group of theologians have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> And that's what happens, by the way. Like, that's a true story right there. So here is one of those areas uh, where the neurochemicals that are released during sex. Um, so oxytocin, you may or may not have heard of, uh, is, uh, they call it the attachment hormone. It's released when a woman breastfeeds her baby. 
And um, they knew that, and that's good because it helps form a, a bond between mother and child so that the mother, you know, will care for her child and not leave it to die or something like that. So this is a good thing, all right? Very easy to explain via evolution how that would happen, okay? You don't even really need God to make sense of this one. Just good, you want your species to survive and stuff, and you should probably care for your children. Okay, so that, that, there's that hormone that's released during breastfeeding. It creates this bond. They've discovered that it's released during sex, too especially in women. And it's so strong, the bond that it creates. One sex therapist, not theologian, by the way, sex therapist says this, when we have sex, we create an involuntary chemical commitment. Okay, it may be involuntary, but there is a chemical commitment there. There is no such thing as no strings attached sex. Our brains are put in strings during the act. There's no way around it. Or an advice columnist in Glamour, not Christianity today, glamour, okay, says this, biology might trump your intentions during casual sex. You may go into this thinking this is gonna be casual, there's gonna be no significance here, and your body, the way God designed it, is going, well, I can't actually do that. That's not possible. The same is true for men, by the way. Now, it's not oxytocin, there's a little bit of that in us, but the main neurochemical responsible for the male response in sex is vasopressin, You know what they call this one? It's not the attachment hormone. They call it the monogamy molecule because it creates that same bond so that you're actually attached to the one person you're supposed to be with. Now, what does this mean? Um, Miriam Grossman is a uh, psychiatrist at UCLA, and she was horrified at the restraints put on her as somebody counseling college students in the area of sex because she had to adopt this no-strings-attached approach because that's dogma. And again, we're, we're fundamentalists in our culture today, secular fundamentalists, and so you, you, you can't uh, disagree with this fundamentalism. So she wrote a book called Unprotected, great title for the book, to kind of say, look, we're taught them about condoms, but <laughs> there's some other stuff going on here that they need protection from. She says that we are designed to bond. You gotta love that word design, don't you? It implies a designer, because there is a designer. Or Laura Winner, who's a Duke University professor, uh, paraphrases verse 16. Here's verse 16. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? And she says it like this. Don't you know that when you sleep with somebody, your body makes a promise, whether you do or not? Can't escape it. That's the problem with our hookup culture, which is what we inhabit. So rampant, so rampant, and, and apps like Tinder just making it worse. But it's because a hookup culture tries to create this divide between physical intimacy and emotional or even spiritual intimacy that is simply impossible. People assume we can draw clean lines between the emotional and sexual aspects of a relationship, but you can't, you can't. We've already seen it doesn't work biologically speaking, just empirical observation. But there's more to it than that. George Bernard Shaw, the writer in uh, the play Too True to Be Good, which is just a great title for a play, by the way. That's the English lit major in me. I can't escape them. Uh, says this, when men and women pick one another up just for a bit of fun, they find they've picked up more than they bargained for because men and women have a top story as well as a ground floor. That's a great image, isn't it? And that's the the problem. You can't just buy the ground floor of the house. They're gonna make you buy the whole thing. It comes together. We are whole. We are integrated. We can't draw these lines where God has not drawn them. Again, going back to Scrivener and just kind of working out uh, the implications of God's existence for our sexuality, our our bodies are not playgrounds. Sex cannot be just recreational which means that that power play at the heart of reality wounds and wounds deeply us and those we sleep with. No wonder there's so much anxiety and depression in our culture today. Apparently, contra Foucault, sex isn't saving people. We're having plenty of sex and look at what it's led to. And so Grossman in her book, uh, Unprotected, shares the story of Olivia, who had just had her first sexual encounter and was ghosted afterwards. The guy had left. And she says this, she says, why doctor? Why do they tell you how to protect your body from herpes and pregnancy, but they don't tell you what it does to your heart? It wounds. We can't escape one flesh wholeness. 
In essence, you could say the biblical sexual ethic is, is just this, to say with your body what you intend to say with your whole life. Or don't say with your body what you're unwilling to say with your whole life. Quote Tim Keller again, he says, sex is God's appointed way for two people to say reciprocally to one another, I belong completely, permanently, and exclusively to you. Completely, permanently, exclusively to you. That's a covenant right there. That's what we were talking about. Or C.S. Lewis says, extramarital sex is like trying to isolate one kind of union, the sexual, from all the other kinds that make up a total union. And again, you can't separate it. That's why the Bible calls us away from sexual immorality, porneia, with its root idea of to buy, to exploit, to use. Calls us away from a a consumer approach to buy, right? From a consumer approach to sex and calls us toward a covenant approach to sex, completely, permanently, exclusively. Christopher Yuan, a moody prof in his A book, Holy Sexuality, which is just excellent, would recommend it highly, sums up the biblical sexual ethic, what he calls holy sexuality. Now you know where the title came from. Sums up holy sexuality in these two phrases. He says, this is it. This is the sum total of holy sexuality right here. Chastity and singleness, faithfulness and marriage. It's all you need to know. Chastity and singleness, faithfulness in marriage. Now, he says, chastity implies more than mere abstention from sex. It conveys ideas of purity and holiness, which are required. And faithfulness in marriage means more than just don't commit adultery, but gets at that covenant commitment that we were talking about. So chastity and singleness, faithfulness in marriage, he says this afterwards, and it's nice because he teases out some of the implications for us. Both of these embody the only correct biblical sexual ethic and unambiguously articulate the exact expressions of sexual behavior that God blesses, which is important right there, by the way, we're gonna come back to this in later weeks, but of course, God is the one who designs sex. God is pro-sex. There's a book of the Bible that's pretty much just about how glorious sex within covenant marriage is. That's what Song of Songs is all about. So yes, God blesses a very specific expression of our sexual desire. Yuan goes on though, he says, too often Christians focus only on marriage in our definitions about holy sexuality, but forget about singleness. And he says this, this is important, he says, case in point, heterosexuality as the ideal, says nothing about chastity in singleness. Again, it's important. He's the one who points out that heterosexuality is, again, it's a Freudian term, so it's a useless term. Freud contributed nothing to human understanding, okay? So a useless term, we, we have to do better than this, and here's why. He shares the story of a mom who came to him. She had two sons, and one of them had left the faith to pursue an active uh, gay lifestyle. And so she's coming to him because that's what he was saved um, out of as well. He was uh, practicing uh, same-sex lifestyle and all of that, and he's converted out of his unbelief, and so that's why he writes about this, practicing chastity and singleness uh, at this point. Well, so this mom comes to him heartbroken, and she says this. She says, how come my son can't be normal? Which is another not a good biblical term. Not really helpful theologically. But here's what she meant by this too. She said, why can't he uh, he be more like my other son who is, Yuan discovers, living with his girlfriend who's pregnant with their child. That's what she was hoping for him because heterosexuality is normal and homosexuality is deviant. And the Bible says, are you kidding me? That's what you took away from this? No, we gotta do much, much better than that. We have to articulate a consistent biblical ethic of sexuality because Jesus does not ask of anyone what he does not ask of everyone. Step four, flee to Christ and his gospel. Let me read verses 18 to 20. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So the average age at which a boy first encounters porn is nine at this point. 
which means they've got a decade of viewing porn under their belt before they reach adulthood. I was five, so nine sounds great. That seems like that would have saved me a lot of trouble. But what does that mean? You've got 10 years of soaking your brain in this stuff means that you are literally incapable of interacting with real people by the end of that decade. Your brain is so badly rewired. And the stats on porn usage are just disturbing, both outside the church and inside the church. And, and you kind of go, why? Why is porn so bad? Now, lust is one answer, of course, but that's not the whole of it, because lust has been there since Eden, so that can't explain it. Of course, we know the answer. It's the sheer ubiquity of the temptation. You carry around a porn library in your pocket at this point. That's what a smartphone is. So it used to be, if you wanted porn, you had to drive to the seedy part of town and park your car in front of the seedy store and get out and flip your collar up and put your hat on, hope nobody notices you, and really hope you don't run into anyone from church when you're inside. That doesn't happen anymore. You don't need that. You got all the anonymity in the world available to you. So Alex Duke, in his article, How Sex Became King, says this. He says the arithmetic is simple. I'm gonna talk about why porn has exploded. Infinite occasion plus unchecked desire equals disaster. He, he compares it to an alcoholic uh, renting a, an apartment above a bar. Of course, plenty of implications here for parents, by the way. You're giving your kid, your 16-year-old hormone-infested son, unfiltered access to the internet. It's like renting him a bedroom in a strip club. I'm sure he'll be fine. He goes to youth group. I'll quote Matt Chandler here, one of the things he always says, I love you, you're stupid. <laughs> right? If that's the approach you're taking, you're stupid. There's no other way to say that. There's probably a better biblical term. It'd be folly, but it means the same thing, okay? Don't do that. Now, this is just one area, all right? I'm just picking on porn right here, but Paul's advice rings clear in this section, right? When it comes to things like that, flee. Run away. That's what he's saying here. This is interesting, because you read through the New Testament, you talk to guys like Paul and Peter, and you know what they say, so you can picture the conversation, it goes like this, you go up to Paul and Peter, you're like, you guys are big saints and stuff like that, can I ask you a question? I'm struggling with temptation. And they're like, oh, I'm glad you came, I'm glad you're seeking help. Okay, here's what you do, stand firm in the Lord. And Peter chimes in, because he is impetuous Peter, he's gotta chime in here, right? So he says, that's good Paul, but I'm gonna do you one better, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Nice, that's good. And then Paul says, okay, but no, you know, just out of curiosity here, uh, what's the area? What, what, what temptation are you talking about? Like, well, it's sexual immorality. And their faces change, and they go, oh, no, 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 no. Don't stand firm, my friend. Don't resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You run away. There's one area in the New Testament where Paul and Peter go, get out of there. Don't mess around with this one. Run away from sexual temptation. Again, it's what we saw before. The Bible treats sexual immorality with the utmost seriousness, and so must we. But now this is important, because I brought up this word temptation, and we need to talk through the difference between temptation and desire. We gotta just do a little bit of definition here. Because here's the thing, we will all be tempted in many ways, but temptation is not sin. That's important because your desires may be sin. And this is why it's so important we separate these two out. Your desire may be sin. It has to do with your desired end. If what you desire is sinful, then the desire itself is sinful. Jesus makes this very clear. Matthew chapter five. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery. I tell you, if you even look at a woman lustfully, that's the desire. By the way, the word lust in Greek is desire. It's the exact same word, thumia. So I mean, that, there it is, there's the desire. If you even desire her, you've committed adultery in your heart. So desire can be, you can see this difference, right? I'm married, okay, so faithfulness in marriage. My wife and I are walking along somewhere and some scantily clad woman uh, parades in front of us. This happens, our culture is not particularly modest culture. That's temptation. That's temptation, but that's not sin. My wife hits me at that moment and says, how dare you? <laughs> no right to be offended, okay? No right to be offended. 
Now, if my eyes track with scantily clad women, and more importantly, my mind tracks with her, well, that's a little different. We're gonna have a little different conversation afterwards. That's the difference between temptation and desire. Here's why this matters so much when we articulate a biblical sexual ethic. Because when we use the phrase same-sex attraction, it's unclear which one we're talking about. So somebody who is attracted primarily to members of their own sex, which the Bible prohibits, we've seen even in our passage already, what does that mean? Is the attraction temptation or is it desire? Well, of course, it could include both. It means that the temptation is going to be different. Which gender person walking by scantily clad is the temptation? But if you make you use this unclear term, same-sex attraction, it may mean the temptation piece, and you're gonna force people into really what is just unbearable shame. They're gonna feel like the temptation itself is sin, and there's no escape from it, as opposed to the desire. Probably say more about that. Read Yuan's book, it'll help you there. You can flesh it out a bit, much, a bit more. But uh, notice, though, that in, in this step four here, I didn't say just flee from temptation, but flee to Christ and his gospel. I said that because that's how we flee temptation. It just doesn't work to just constantly run away all the time. Uh, we gotta do something else. So how we flee temptation, Hebrews helps us out here. The first two songs we sang this morning really help us out too, because we're singing about Jesus as our high priest. He's Hebrews 4.15, just explaining what that means. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. By the way, quite clear there then that temptation is not the same thing as sin. Jesus, tempted in every way, just as we are, experienced the gamut of temptation, yet did not sin. Earlier in Hebrews, the author tells us this is not just, uh, it doesn't just mean that he can offer us sympathy because he had the same experience, but actually practical help. Here's Hebrews 2.18. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus knows what we suffer. He knows what the struggle feels like so we can look to him for our example. Because in truth, he actually knows temptation better than we do. And here's why you're going, well, that can't be true. You know, he's God. He wasn't gonna sin, so of course, he doesn't really get it. B.F. Westcott, the great Cambridge scholar, says this. This is such an important quote. Lean in on this one, would you? He says this. The power of sympathy lies not in the mere capacity for feeling, but in the lessons of experience. And again, sympathy with the sinner in his trial does not depend on the experience of sin, but on the experience of the strength of the temptation to sin, which only the sinless can know in its full intensity. He who falls yields before the last strain. No one of us has ever experienced the full strength of temptation because we've all given in before then. Only Jesus endured to the very end and experience 100% of temptation's power. Jesus understands temptation better than you. He faced a greater temptation in Gethsemane and he endured. We flee to him not just for our example but for strength as well. What does that mean exactly? How do we go to him to get strength to resist temptation? This is where we flee to his gospel in particular. The gospel is what strengthens us to resist temptation. When we're tempted, we're seeking fullness apart from Christ. We think something else will satisfy our fleshly lusts and fill up those empty spaces within us. And by the way, fleshly lust here, I'm not just talking about sexual lust. I mean anything. You can be talking about money or power or control. You could be talking about uh, just making sure that the house is really neat and in order because it makes you feel like you got your whole life together, right? Like that's a promise that just having your house in order is making to suggest that's where my fullness comes from. Okay, so that's, that's how temptation works. The key to resisting temptation is to fill those empty spaces to fill those empty spaces with what truly satisfies. How do we do this? We do this by feasting on the gospel so that we experience the fullness of his love. 
what we're seeking, the fullness of his love. Our bodies are not our own. If you belong to Christ, you belong to him twice. You were created by him. So you are his by virtue of creation and you were redeemed by him. As it says right there at the end of our passage, you were bought at a price and at a steep price, the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, if you're paying really close attention today, you notice I skipped a verse. Did you notice that? Everybody's like, oh no. (laughs) He's gonna call on me, isn't he? Let me read the passage again. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. You ever been so happy to come across a past tense verb before? That is what some of you were. And that phrase makes us just a little bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? I mean, you can picture this letter being read aloud to the church in Corinth and people are looking down again because they're going, I hope nobody notices that he's talking about me. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Although we are all sexually broken, we can become sexually whole through Christ and his gospel. There is cleansing, you were washed. And there is healing transformation, you were sanctified. And there is forgiveness, you were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the spirit of our God, by his blood applied to us in the gospel. Let's pray for that even now. Lord, in the midst of such bad news, knowing that this sin is true of us, this is who we were, there is such good news. This is not who we have to be any longer. There is forgiveness in the blood of Christ and there is fullness in the intimacy that we can know with you. We can be fully satisfied, completely joyful, even as we live out the biblical sexual ethic, chastity and singleness, faithfulness in marriage, because you are more than enough. And so we rest in you even now. We pray that the gospel would fill those empty spaces in our hearts and lives, that we pursue our fleshly lust to try in vain to fill instead. Free us from that, Lord. Free us to know you, to be known by you, and to enjoy the fullness of your love in Christ. It says, in his name we pray, amen.